Welcome back to the Foundry's YouTube channel. We're so happy that you decided to connect with us to see what God is doing in and through our church. If you want to stay connected throughout the week, please like us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Without further ado, let's dive into the series I'm so excited about called Believe. So Ephesians, these are people, like we are Michiganders, right? Or you're a Californian, or a Coloradan, or an Indianian. No, nope, that's not how it works. They're just different and in the middle. All right, so you, you get this kind of idea of the Ephesian people. Well, they were a people, and it's an important reality for us as the church to take a moment and look at these letters to the churches, specifically to the one in Ephesus. It's the first letter, it's the first kind of uh, church that Jesus addresses to John. But um, before we dive in, let me ask you this, and I'm gonna ask you to do me a favor, you gotta be interactive. If you're not gonna be interactive, I'm going to actively boo you because it's just, it seems the right thing to do in church. Occasionally a good boo kind of rustles the spirit. So um, help me out here. Who remembers the first time you had a Valentine? And I'm not talking a janky Valentine. The first time your little heart was thumping and you're like, it's finally my February 14th and I'm going to pour my heart out. Anybody remember that? Remember the first time? Okay, some of you need to work on that. Okay, so we, we have this... Like your first Valentine, it's so it's so special, it's so good, there's so much love to be shared, right? How about lately? Like in just a few days, like there's a number of us, it's going to be February 12th, and you're going to be like, oh, it's that Hallmark holiday again, I got to tell her I love her. Awesome, Right? It's just like, what, what sad polarity is that, right? Because the first time when you have your Valentine and it's just so amazing versus that mentality, you know, the only Hallmark made it up so they can make more movies, right? And ruin my Christmas too. Like that's how it feels sometimes. There's this, this weird, well, it feels very different than it did in the beginning. Erica and I went to a play, uh, a musical, uh, a number of weeks ago, it was, it was back in October, and a friend named Vicky gave us tickets. They were great seats right down, like right in the middle. It was so good. And let me, let me just set the scene for you, because it plays into this. There is um, a dad. He has five daughters. And you may think, that's a lot. We've got a guy in the church. Kurt and his wife Amy have six, so he's got them beat. But um, Tevia has five daughters, his wife, Golda, is uh, the mother of those children, and they live in Anatevka, Russia. They're Jewish Russians, and it's a story about his daughters basically falling in love, and they fall in love, and they're in a culture where they arrange marriage. Your marriage is arranged, and you are betrothed really without ever maybe even meeting the person or knowing who they are, and his daughters fall in love, and he's watching his daughters fall in love and beg him to let them marry the person they love, not the person they're going to be betrothed to. Their heart is like full of love, and they're like, Dad, please just listen to me. He's a good man. All the stories we've all heard is my mom-in-law sits right there. I think I said these things. Um, like, like, please, just give him a chance, right? Give him a chance. And after watching his daughters fall in love and buck tradition, he begins to reflect on the fact that he's part of an arranged marriage. He and his wife, Golda, had been arranged. So he goes to her, hat in hand, and looks up and says, do you love me? And she says, I cook all your meals. Do you love me? I gave you five daughters, but do you love me? I cook, I clean, I milk the cow. What do you want? Love. Do you love me? Answered by, look at all I do for you. And we can have that economic view of love sometimes. And when we have that view of love, what happens is we miss out on the gift of what love truly is. Ephesus, the city that was. The city that was. 
It was the third largest city in the empire of Rome. There was Rome, you know, Alexandria, and then right there in the middle was Ephesus. Ephesus was number three in terms of size. But in terms of culture, it was the leading edge. It was if you took New York City and Hollywood, not L.A., Hollywood, and blended them together, the weird little baby they would come up with would be Ephesus, a huge port city that is full of sailor town culture, but weird, like, just mystical beliefs all over the map. There were temples to every god known to the pantheon of the Greeks and the Romans, and one was prized most of all, one of the wonders of the world, the temple of Diana in Ephesus. It was a massive city. It was a highly influential city. It was, well, it was the culture. It was all meshed together, and it was this amazing kind of coming together of the East and the West and joining these mystical beliefs. It was crazy. It was a spiritual hot mess. It was like a dark, dark kind of sticky soup of spirituality, really carnal, over-sexualized terribleness, and throw in the port city, the trade, and all this. Ephesus was a really big deal in the ancient world. In the Roman Empire, it's number three. You know, in America, it's uh, New York, Chicago, New York, LA, and Chicago. It's the Chicago size. It's a huge city in the middle of the empire. And we find that the Christians in this city of Ephesus, the Ephesian Christians, were, um, were isolated because they were outside of culture. They were persecuted because they lived under the rule of Nero, Domitian. Trajan, all these horrible Roman emperors who did terrible things to the church. And when you persecuted people, you really focused on the major urban areas when you tried to stamp out Christianity. Christianity, It wasn't just in the outlying areas. They really would put, it, put the wood to the people in the centers of culture. So they were isolated, these Christians were. They were persecuted, and they would have been impoverished because they would have been outside the social norm. They would have been different. And Paul, the apostle, preached there. He planted a church in Ephesus. The apostle John, during the war that started in 67 AD in Jerusalem, 70 AD, Jerusalem falls, uh, John takes Mary, the mother of Jesus, and historically it is understood and believed that they went to Ephesus. Can you imagine being the pastor of Jesus' mom? Right? And John... So this is the people we're talking about. It's a big deal. And I would say that um, it's this, this huge cultural city that has something happening in it. And Jesus Christ has something to say. The church was planted in about AD 52. It was kind of beginning to sprout. By the early 80, like 60, 57 to 60, it was um, sprouting and they were starting to nurture and water the church. It was taking root, growing up and in the dark kind of growth underneath, but it's really starting to sprout. You're starting to see the church. By the mid-60s, Paul, the founding pastor of the Ephesian church, dies under Emperor Nero when he was in Rome. He was executed there and the church is becoming fruitful. Now it's not just this little thing you nurture. It is a growing fruitful church. It is a powerful, influential body of Christ. By 67, it has many of the church fathers that are left and the apostle John leading it. It's an amazing church. By 70 AD, the exodus out of uh, Jerusalem has taken place as Titus had sacked Jerusalem, and we find Ephesus being a place where there's a lot of expatriate Jewish people coming in, and the church is starting to really thrive and be fruitful. And it's at that point, about 70 to 90, we find John on the island of Patmos. When the Spirit of God, he's in the Spirit, and Jesus stands behind him and starts talking to him. These next words are the words of Jesus to the Apostle John, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these are the words of him who hold the seven stars in his hand and walk among the golden lampstands. I know your deeds. I know your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. I know that you have been tested. And I know that those who claim to be apostles You have kind of found them out. You have looked into it and you know they're not and you've proven them to be false. 
You have persevered and you have endured for my name and you have not grown weary. Man, if there could be an epitaph for a church, wouldn't that want to be like, that's Jesus talking to a church. Listen to it again. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars, walks among the golden lampstands, and he says to them, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. And that when people, you've tested those who came in saying they're apostles and they are not and you prove them false and you have persevered, you have endured for my name and you haven't grown weary. I mean, you can hang your hat on those words. That is about as good as a church could get hearing from their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a really big deal. Good deeds. Like he's saying, you do good things. You do it all the time. I know of them. It's evident. Your hard work. Your hard work, it's, yeah, I mean, hard work shows itself, doesn't it? Someone's like, I worked really hard. Well, what'd you do? Well, maybe I thought about working hard, right? Hard work shows up. You can tell when there's hard work. There's, there's fruit from it. I've seen your good deeds. I've seen your hard work. I've seen your perseverance. I know the emperors on the throne in Rome who have murdered, killed, and taken your leaders. I know what your founding pastor went through. I know what happened to you. I've seen you persevere and be isolated, impoverished, and broken. I know that you've persevered. I know that you defend the truth. You're defenders of the truth. You hold on to it. Verse 2, it flat out says it. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance, and I know you don't tolerate wicked people. And when a false apostle comes, you put them to the test, and you either prove them true or false. Like he knows. Jesus is saying, I know this. It's a hub for the church. It's a centerpiece for the church. It reminds me of the words of Short and Sweet, our series last fall, when, they would, when John, the apostle, and the others, Jude and Titus, they would be talking and it would say, don't listen to false teachers. This is the church that tested them, found them out, and rooted them out of the church. If we look at what the church was doing, I think you and I would say that they checked all the important boxes, wouldn't you? Anybody else? You're like, yeah, that church is, I mean, that's as good as it gets. That church is so good. There are still qualities that we uphold in the church today. We uphold these qualities, and I can tell you this. The church in Ephesus was the most influential Christian body in the world, more over than even the church in Jerusalem. The church in Ephesus was doing things in breaking ground that would have been mind-boggling to the first century Christians. They were unbelievable. They were as good as it gets. They were faithful. And they did all these things because they, I mean, they were faithful to God. They had John, the apostle. It was a big deal. It was a big deal. It was where truth was taught. But there is a jarring phrase sliding through the words of Scripture that is going to hit these words like a truck. And it says this, yet I hold this against you. I hold this against you. Like all those words. And then, but there's one thing, kind of a big deal. And I hold this against you. After that list of accomplishments, this phrase seems shocking. It's not what you think, right? You think they're going to get a crown thrown at them, but no. Jesus says, I hold this against you. And when we see those words, it should, it should rattle us a little. We should get the feeling of Jesus saying, don't, you're, don't get too high on your horse. There is one thing. And we're sitting kind of going, with all this good, how can there be any negative? Yet I hold this against you, Jesus says. You have forsaken your first love. You have forsaken your first love. The love you had at first. You have walked away from it. You have abandoned it. Think of that. Think of how painful it would be to hear those words. The Apostle John knew this church. He pastored this church. It would have been people he knew and loved. But the founding pastor of the church of Ephesus, Paul, had written another letter to a different church in Corinth. 
and he actually deals with the issue at hand of what God is saying, I have this against you. You've forsaken the love you had at first. Sometimes we get into a mode that I think as Christians is dangerous. We find ourselves doing the right thing. Anybody take pride in doing the right thing? Don't worry, I'm not entrapping you. I take pride in doing the right thing sometimes. Like sometimes I just slow down on the freeway. I'm like, I'm doing the right thing. Like Spike Lee would be proud. Do the right thing, right? Maybe not. But for me, like do the right thing, it feels good. A justice-minded person always does the right thing. Even when it's very costly, they do the right thing. It's what you do. But here's the problem. We should do everything we do, not because it's right, but out of an overflowing response of love to God. Loving Jesus Christ is the only thing. Doing the right thing literally doesn't matter. The only thing is loving Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul in Corinthians the founding pastor wrote another letter to the Corinthian church, and in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, it says this. If I speak in tongues of angels, but I have not love, I am nothing but the clashing of symbols, right? Oh, man, so brutal when you're in a parade and somebody walks by and they get right by you and like, Ksh! right? That's a terrible sound. I mean, unless you play cymbals and then well done, you're really good in it, but... um. But it's kind of rough, right? It's like, shh. Paul's saying, if I can speak in the tongues of heaven, the language of heaven, but I miss love, I am nothing more than clashing symbols. And if I can prophesy, if I have the gift of prophecy, and I can fathom all mysteries, and have all knowledge, and have a faith that moves mountains, I am nothing. Nothing. If I give all that I have for the poor and I submit my body to the flames to die a martyr's death and I do not have love, I gain nothing. Nothing. The heart of the matter is not doing the right thing. It's loving the only thing. It's loving Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul would write to the Ephesians a book called Ephesians. And the reality of this is seen in what he does. Because you would think it would be kind of antithetical that he would say, you know, um, don't do anything outside of love. So we'd think maybe I shouldn't do anything. Paul worked like a rented mule when he lived there. He was a tent maker so he wouldn't kind of burden the people he had planted a church for. He didn't want to draw on their finances, so he got a job and planted a church. Like, well done. Well done. It says this in Acts chapter 20 when Paul was uh, in Ephesus. In everything I did, I showed you that this, by this uh, kind of hard work, we must help the weak, so doing something, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It is better to give than to receive. He's not doing it because he feels guilty. He's doing it because he loves Jesus and he believes what he said. He believes what he said. And Paul would go on to pray a prayer in the book of Ephesians over the church, and I think it's worth just going through it, just taking a minute and looking at it. For this reason, Paul says, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives and gets its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together to know and understand with all God's holy people and grasp how wide and how long and how deep and how high is the love of Christ And know that this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the fullness of God in the love of Christ. Paul is saying to them, my only prayer is this, that you love him. If you love him, it will grow. It will be life to the bones of your community. Love him. That's what Paul is crying out to those people. Listen to these words from Revelation chapter 2, following the text we had just written. Read, uh, read um, this is out of the same text. 
Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider now how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you. I will remove your lamp and I will take it from its place. I mean, that's a warning from Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. That should probably send a shiver up anything that shakes because that's terrifying. If you do not repent, if you do not turn back, I will come and remove from you the lamp So let's talk real quick. Do the things you did at first. What was that? What was that? When you think about, what do you do at first when you're a Christian? You remember when you became a Christian? It's one of my favorite days in my entire life. It's the only day that's better than my wedding day. I love that day. August 6th, 1994. Jesus Christ decided to make himself my Lord and my Savior. And it changed everything. I was, I was just, I was so joyful. This kid who had been lost and doing everything for attention and all that, that hasn't changed too much. But, um, but doing like just kind of just grasping and desperate trying to find anything of value. And then suddenly there was a peace that passed all understanding. What was it like at first in Ephesus? when they turned to Christ? What was their behavior? What was it, what was that? I wonder, because it says this, their lack of love for Jesus now that they have forsaken it, it's a sin. Because God doesn't say repent of something unless it's a sin. And he says, repent of it, turn back to me, and come home, or I'm gonna take your lampstand. Repent of it, to not love Jesus Christ is a sin. Jesus Christ said this, you can summarize the law and the prophets and love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And it tells me this, if you love God that much, your neighbor is not gonna be an issue. You're gonna love him, unfortunately for many of us. We're gonna be like, oh, I wish I didn't love you. But God bless you, sir, you know? We get mad because all of a sudden God changes us. Why? Because we love him. We love him. In loving Jesus Christ, we experience him. But their lack of love is a sin, and they were doing great things. The church of Ephesus was killing it. They were doing amazing things, but their motivation wasn't love. It might have been duty. It might have been doing the right thing, but it wasn't love. What was it? What was the thing they were doing? What was motivating them? Do you think it could have been self? Like suddenly this church had some prestige. I'm gonna see if I can, you know, get on the elder board, be known. Maybe I'm gonna get one of those little white biscuit collars, one of the first ones I ever had. I'm gonna be important in Ephesus. Maybe for them it was uh, gaining approval because you'd been a horrible kind of person before and in Christ you're a new creation and they just wanted approval. So they were doing all the right things, not because they loved Jesus, because they wanted something. Maybe they, like you, were serving Jesus Christ and doing all the right things to get the nicest chariot in their garage. Maybe they, like you and I, were hoping to get the house with the most columns on the front and the most influence. Maybe they, like you and I, were doing things to make sure people looked at them to look important, or to be busy. Oh, man, there's a lowercase God, G-O-D, lowercase, in our culture, especially in ministry, it's busy. How you doing? Oh, I'm busy. Serving the Lord like crazy. How are things? Not good. Not good. I'm just busy, right? How, what? But busy looks good. And I will tell you this, as a pastor, there are times where I thrive on being busy because it says, you're valuable, someone wants to talk to you, and that is an idol, and it's not out of a love for God. Do you struggle with this like I do? Doing the right thing, but not doing the thing? Loving him the way he called us to love him? Ephesus, the city that was. Jesus warned, if you don't repent, I'm going to come and I'm going to remove your lampstand. Alexandria, still there. Northern Egypt, 
a thriving city with a great like tourist culture and just a little to the, um, I think it's to the east of it is the region of Giza where Mike Lindell at my pillow grows his magic co- cotton for sheets. Yeah, if you've ever seen, I want them super like pastor appreciation month. I want Giza sheets. Um, so yeah, right there, right? Northern Africa, still there. Rome, still there. You can't go to Ephesus and meet anybody unless they're Christian tourists on a study because it is desolate. It is a wasteland. There is no inhabitants. There are ruins and amphitheaters and colonnades to the, to the deity Diana. It's, there's ruins everywhere. That city sits empty because the light of Christ was pulled from that city, I believe. The river silted in the port. The industry went away. And everybody just left. And the third largest city in the Roman Empire ceased to exist. That's terrifying. That's terrifying. Jesus speaks and he means something. And what he's meaning in this is love me. Love me. Don't do things for me. He doesn't need us. He's almighty, sovereign God. He loves us. And he calls us to one thing. We love me. And when we look at it that way, we can understand that this message should not be lost on us. Listen to me when I say it, church. Things have gone well for the foundry. It will stop tomorrow if we do the right thing. But if we love him, if we love him, he will grow people in the faith. He will reach the lost, and he will be praised, him and alone, him alone, for that, if we love him. We are called not to just do the right thing. We are called to love Jesus Christ. So don't let the message be lost. The scripture goes on to say, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, to the one who is victorious. Get this, I will give them the right to eat from the tree of life which is in my garden and paradise. Genesis 3. Adam and Eve commit the first sin. Separation from God takes place. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, right? Genesis 3 is where the fall happens, where where the first sin takes place. And separation, sin enters the world. And what does God do? He resists, he refuses them entry to the garden where the tree of life is. And he puts an angel, if you did devotions this week, if you would have known that he put an angel standing with a flaming sword in front of the tree of life, guarding them from the tree of life. Why? Because they had broken relationship and death was soon to follow. What does this say? Whoever has ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, to the one who is victorious in not doing everything, but in loving me, the one who gets the real prize, the one who loves me, I will give them the right to eat from the tree of life. Humanity had been cut off, and now we're being called home. For those of us who love Christ, some in Ephesus may have heeded this word from the Lord to to turn back, but I don't believe the church did because in a few centuries, the church is gone. The city is gone. The culture is gone because there was an absence of something critical, a love for God. So hear a clear warning. And don't act like it doesn't apply to us. We've been listening and we should tune our ears to what the Spirit is saying and take to heart. We must believe the word for the church in Ephesus as though he spoke it to Zealand because the authoritative word of God speaks to us, love me. Don't just do the right thing. He doesn't want 1% of your giving and 2.5 Sundays a month. That's not Christianity. He wants you to love him. He wants you to love him. And we can make no bones or excuses about the fact of, well, I did all I could for him. That's not what he asked. Will you love me? Do you remember how things used to be? I asked it a minute ago. Do you remember when your faith was new? How good it felt? How alive you were? Do you remember the sweetness of being forgiven and realizing all those past sins were gone? Do you remember that? Anybody else? Like, God, this is the best. Do you remember the sweetness of salvation? Do you remember what it was like to know you were forgiven, understanding you were loved? Do you remember? You wanted to tell people. You're like, I'm going to read that Bible. I'm going to see what's going on. Then you read Judges, and you're like, I need to go to school. 
It's a messed up book, right? And there's things in there that drive you crazy, but you look and you go, but God still speaks. You wanted to devour the word. You prayed about everything. You loved him. You loved him. You chased him. He was all you had. There were things you did at first to serve and to love people because you loved Jesus. There were things you and I did at first, and now we're too busy. We've got work. More important things to do than love Jesus. And I would say no. This tells us we should probably have a caution if we're just doing the things we should and not pursuing a love relationship with Christ. Because you and I can be like, look, God, look at all I did for you. Look at my list of, of, of accomplishments. Look at the things I did. And I believe the words of Jesus would be hauntingly familiar to a tune I heard this fall. Do you love me? See, we don't, we don't always love him. We talk about it. But I want to challenge you to love him. It'll change you. It'll wreck you. It'll be awesome. Love him. There is, there is the thing with Jesus that changes the whole dynamic because he doesn't say, just love me. And if I'm in the mood, I'll love you back. Because Jesus, well, in John 21, Jesus is cooking fish on a beach. And there's a disciple of his who had betrayed him and run off. Peter, he's in a boat fishing. He's gone back to his career. He's betrayed Jesus. Where can you go from there? So he goes back to his old life. And Jesus sees him, and Peter comes running to Jesus. They have breakfast on the beach, and then Jesus and Peter take a walk down the beach. And and I just want you to hear it with me, some humanity with it. We can so sanitize Scripture that it doesn't have humanity. And forgive my horrible singing, but can you imagine Jesus just walking and asking Peter, do you love me? Jesus, you know that I love you, was his response. Then feed my sheep. Not because I'm telling you to feed sheep, but do it because you love me. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Then Peter, take care of my lambs. Because you love me, do the things that matter most to me. A third time Jesus says, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. I don't want you to volunteer here. I want you to love him here. I don't want you to give here. I want you to love him here. I don't want you to go out and just tell somebody your testimony. I want you to love Jesus Christ so much that when he sings that phrase to you, you can say, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. You know that I love you. Broken as I am, I did my best. I would love, love for this church to experience that because I would love to experience it myself. If I'm honest, church, I don't, I don't always love him. I know it's terrible and I think it can get me fired. I don't always love him. I do what I should. May those words haunt our ears Do you love me? Do you love me? Because if you do, this world doesn't stand a chance. It will bend the knee to the love of Christ as his church lives it out. Lord Jesus Christ, we your church, just we just take a moment, we confess. We, we don't love you the way we should. And at times, God, we, we, if we're honest, we don't love you at all. We just do what we should to not go to hell. And that is missing the point completely. So tonight, we ask God in that weird, empty, vacant space called religion in our life, would you remove all hypocrisy and all good works and put into us a craving to love you, a craving to love you and to know you, a craving to respond to our love for you in this world in a way that will change the world because you love them. So Lord Jesus Christ, may we not get hung up on the good press of maybe what's going on in the church. 
May we, may we make sure we're doing the one thing that you held against the church of Ephesus. May we not forsake the love we had at first. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to watch this week's message. If you're looking for a way to prepare for next week, click the link below in the description box. There's where you'll find devotions. Now devotions are a crucial part of the Foundry's weekly rhythm. I hope this message has been encouraging, but also challenging for you. And we'd love to see you again next week.